Few intellectual properties have lit a fire under the collective imaginations as Dark Souls. Whether we're talking about Dark Souls' incredible creature designs, wonderful environmental storytelling, or intriguing and interesting world building, there are few games or few properties that have done as much for fantasy role-playing games as Dark Souls, and it can be one of those things that serves as a phenomenal inspiration for making your own monsters. Hello everybody, I'm Kyle Ott, and you're watching Desks and Dorks. A couple things before we talk about how to make your fantasy role-playing monsters more like Dark Souls. Um, a couple things first and foremost, please like, share, comment, subscribe, specifically sharing. Um, I know I say this every single time, but a single share actually boosts our viewership a ton. So if you like what we do here and you want to support it, the best way that you can do that is to share. Seriously, it helps me out a metric ton. Um, so again, that's like the easiest way to help us out, but I appreciate all the other stuff too. Two, if you really want to help us out and you want to show some financial love, uh, you can go ahead and you can get our games over at World of Game Design or itch.io. Actually, if you're interested in getting PDFs, we are doing a partnership with our friends over at Symphony Entertainment. We are in the middle of doing a live play of A Fear Within, which is our horror RPG. And in honor of that, um, we are actually doing a wonderful little discount on all of our PDFs. So you can get a Fear Within for five whole dollars, or you can get After the Rain for eight bucks if you're interested in the PDFs over at itch.io. Okay, all of that out of the way right now. Let's talk about how to make your monsters a little bit more like Dark Souls. Um, I will die before I stop throwing in a video game donkey reference to that, because that's literally my favorite videos on Dark Souls. Um, okay, so first things first, before we get too much uh, deeper into this, we have to talk about what makes a Dark Souls creature. When I refer to Dark Souls, I am referring to all of the Soulsborne games up to Elden Ring. Um, again, I think Elden Ring creatures are Dark Souls-like, uh, but they generally skew a little bit more to the high fantasy rather than the Soulsborne. Um, so when I'm referring to Dark Souls, please know that I am including Demon Souls, which is the first game within that franchise, Dark Souls 1, 2, and 3, Bloodborne, and Sekiro. Those are the ones that I'm using um, when I'm sort of analyzing what makes a Dark Souls creature, and I use Dark Souls in air quotes there because I'm kind of referring to uh, all of the titles that I just mentioned. And I came up with three uh, guiding principles, governing principles to Dark Souls creature design. One of them is Savage. Whether you are fighting the lowest level undead in An Orlando to uh, the most terrifying bosses in the game, every single Dark Souls monster is absolutely devastating and absolutely savage. They can kill you. They will kill you. I mean, it is entirely possible to, if you're, you know, like me... <laughs> you can walt waltz into the starting zone and get absolutely one shot by a creature that would be fodder in any other game. Dar that That's kind of what makes Dark Souls creatures savage. Um, unexpected, Dark Souls creatures have a tendency to pop up where you least expect them, but most importantly, they have a tendency to pop up um, where you are most psychologically vulnerable, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. And finally, they have patterns that can be learned and potentially exploited by the players. This trifecta does three things that make Dark Souls both a great RPG and worth emulating in our tabletop role-playing games. The savage part helps to reinforce that your world is dangerous, but it also helps to reinforce that player actions have consequences. This is perfect if you're running something like Faison, or if you're like me and you really like Call of Cthulhu, or Shadow of the Demon Lord, or Flayo. Um, making sure that your players are aware their actions have consequences is really huge, so there's a reason that you might want to make a Dark Souls monster if you want to enforce that idea of playing player consequence or player agency. Um, the fact that they're unexpected can lend to an air of paranoia in your games, which is excellent, again, if you're playing something like Call of Cthulhu, but I find that an air of paranoia is particularly helpful if I'm running an RPG like Blades in the Dark, where you are constantly on the run from the law and worried about whether or not the souls of your dead enemies are going to come and try to get you. And the patterns that can be learned and exploited, you might think that's not potentially useful, um, but in fact, it actually really helps because it lends to player buy-in. If you have been watching this channel for any length of time, you know that I think combat should be a puzzle. And again, making sure that the players have something to invest themselves in, in the form of learning monster patterns, is a great way to get player buy-in. Uh, it's one of the things that I think is most interesting. So, let's talk a little bit about how you can make your creatures a little bit more Dark Souls-like. 
Uh, when we're talking about Savage, I think the first thing that you should lean into is the narration style of things. Um, do not shy away from making your monster's descriptions as horrific as possible. And I included the uh, the gaping dragon here for a reason, because when you try to build Dark Souls to somebody, this is often one of the ones that is used uh, primarily, because look at this horrific evil monster. I mean, this is literally like a ribcage given sentience and then given a, a blatant disregard for everyone else's safety. It's awesome. So when you are describing your creatures, do not shy away from the horrific details. Get into the nitty gritty with it. Um, again, I know this sounds kind of basic, but the narration part of things should be your first um, your vanguard, your your shock troop here, if you want to, you know, use the military description sort of thing. But you really want to sort of lean into this, and then that way that sort of starts um, with the player's imaginations. The other thing that I would encourage you to do is to describe the smells and sounds of these creatures. It's one thing to tell somebody that something looks horrific, but if you say that it smells like day-old vomit that's been stuffed into a tube sock in the back of someone's drawer that carries some visceral gut reactions, right? Um, don't shy away from doing sounds as well. Uh, if you watch our Fear Within campaign, I actually leaned pretty heavily into just a simple drip, 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 drip sound. And by the end of that game, my players were conditioned to know that if something was dripping, it was probably uh, the fresh blood from a uh, recently deceased NPC. That way of doing things, again, leaning into the senses of your players in your narration goes a long way into making your monsters feel more savage. But you know me, I like to enforce this with gameplay. So um, instead of just doing something like increased damage or criticals or whatever, depending on the system that you're using, go for the limbs. Um, we as human beings have a psychological connection to our bodies. It's a really important thing. And if you want to make your stuff feel savage, um, then I think going for the limbs is the best possible way of doing that. And I've created a simple D6 table for you. So regardless of the system that you're using, you can do this. Um, so for example, if an arm or leg is withered, um, you can narrate how the flesh seems to desiccate, how the arm seems to age or the leg seems to age rapidly um, in stark contrast to the rest of the player's body. Um, and again, up to you as the game master what sort of impact that has, um, if you're playing a certain, depending on the system that you are using. But again, um, like a withered leg might have you move at half speed um, during the session. So again, that's a really cool thing to do if you're up against a monster that has some sort of curse. If you're gonna break a limb, lean into the crunching sounds of the bone, the snapping sounds of the tendons, um, as that whatever creature that is like just breaks the, the person's appendage uh, with reckless abandon. And again, um, it's it's withered, uh, as withered, but until it's healed. So this is actually going to encourage the players to go and seek out professional help in a city or a town, or uh, lean on some of their friends who might have professional help. This is a great way to uh, boost people with healing skills, not necessarily healing magic, but healing skills. This would be my recommendation, uh, because it's going to make people uh, really want to do those things or, or take those skills on in one of these settings if you want to reinforce that savagery. And again, lean in on that narration, lean in on the sounds of this injury, on um, the smells of this injury. Um, same thing with the damage. Skull, you could reduce vision. Um, you This player will eventually die to this head wound um, unless it's properly healed. And again, finally, rot um, is something that you could do. This player is going to morph into some sort of undead creature unless it's properly treated within a, a few days. Um, making all of the monsters have some sort of effect like this or... You know, your own custom effect means that combat for the players is no longer just something, aha, I will stride into this and I will win always confidently. It becomes a, oh crap, do I really want to take on this fight knowing that every single enemy has the ability to mess me up irreparably. Um, and this means that the players are going to start thinking a lot more about their actions and start treating combat with a lot more gravitas and care than they otherwise would. It's one of the reasons I love Dark Souls because... And sometimes in Dark Souls, if you can get the drop on somebody and just finish them off and it's not a fair fight, great. But sometimes if you can just get past them and don't fight them, that works too. Um, and again, I think having every monster have some sort of savage ability like the ones that I have laid out on this table is a great way to sort of create that buy-in and that same sense of savagery that a lot of the Soulsborne creatures do. Now, let's talk about unexpected. Um, you want to ambush them where they are vulnerable psychologically. Now, 
The genius of the Dark Souls mimic is that Dark Souls is a game that leans heavily on its safe zones. So once a player feels like they're safe and comfortable and at peace, that's when Dark Souls really starts cooking because it starts throwing these horrible creatures at them and it reinforces this idea that the players are never safe. And so what you want to do as the game master is you want to make sure that the players are um, dealing with unexpected threats, but they're always dealing with unexpected threats at a time where they're psychologically vulnerable. Um, this means that like mimics are totally fine, but I much prefer the use of something like Parasite the Maxim, uh, which plays around fast and loose with the idea that what if the thing, but there were dozens of the thing, and it was all over our hometown, and it could be anybody that you know. Um, so again, I think one of the things that you could do is have a trusted NPC become a member of this sort of shape-changing monstrous race. Um, you want to give him shape-changing, but you want to make sure it is not detectable by magic or other means. So again, if you're playing like Blades in the Dark or something like that, they can't use like special equipment to detect who this is. They might be able to negotiate with spirits necessarily to figure out that that's not a person, doesn't have a, a human soul. Um, but again, it should be really difficult to detect this thing. And you want to give them multiple attacks, right? Uh, and specifically melee attacks. Part of the horror of this sort of psychological shift, I'm going to go back to just our regular image, is the idea that this thing needs to get up close and personal to hurt you. So you want to give them multiple melee attacks. If it's at range, if it's far away from the players, it's less terrifying because it's less upfront and in their business and again since you started with the savage you're doing your job as a game master to narrate and give narration keep that up make it a melee attack and then give them multiple grapples or poison attacks right have this creature pin the players down have them inject the player with venom um, make sure that this encounter is both psychologically scarring and also physically scarring for the player it's going to make that sense of paranoia that much greater and that much more terrifying um, and last but certainly not least, we've talked about learnable patterns before on this channel. If you've watched my video on how to make NPCs that do what they want to do and not necessarily what you or the game master want to do or the players want to do, um, then you'll know that I think learnable patterns are a really interesting feature of tabletop role-playing games. Um, and there's ways that you can make this really simple, again, leaning into that puzzle element of RPGs. So let's talk, for example, about this. This I just call this the Demon Centaur because it's a really simple example of a learnable pattern. So the Centaur will make a full move. It'll charge in to the person, to the party, attacking probably the first available character. It will then attempt to trample somebody that it has knocked over or has attacked first. It will then try to run out of range, and then it will charge again. This is a really simple pattern, but again, it's a pattern that once your players learn, they could potentially exploit. They might, for example, uh, break off combat, get away from the Demon Centaur, come back later after they've dug trenches or dug pits, for example, to deal with the uh, the Centaur's charge attack. Um, again, you want to keep these simple. I would say probably no more than six steps for the players, um, but you and you want to telegraph them um, in some way with the narration. So, for example, maybe it, it beats its hooves on the ground before it begins a charge attack, and that's how the players know, oh, it's about to charge us. Um, and again, this is a good way of rewarding player buy-in and strong strategic planning uh, from your characters. I think this is a really interesting way of doing it. But again, keep it simple. I would say anywhere from three to six steps. And then you want to telegraph those in your narration um, and in what you do or what you tell the players. It's going to be really important. Um, but again, you'd be surprised how much player buy-in this gets. Um, I've done this a couple of times. I particularly like doing this with flying enemies because flight is such an overpowered ability in most of our role-playing games that a lot of my flying enemies will swoop up, attack from the air, swoop down. Uh, attack on the ground, swoop up, attack from the air, swoop down, attack on the ground. And so the players start to understand that there's a rhythm to the combat and they'll plan accordingly. Um, and again, that's made my players feel very smart and very empowered. Uh, it's a great way, again, to have your players start paying attention to every single combat. Uh, and with that, folks, we're going to end our uh, little video today. I hope that you enjoyed this one. hope you found it to be informative. I love Dark Souls. I think Dark Souls is a great franchise. And uh, I think taking some inspiration from its monsters is a wonderful way to add immersion and excitement into your own tabletop role-playing games. Again, if you like what we do here, please give us a like, a share, a comment, a subscribe. And if you really like what we do here, uh, you can give us some of your financial support and you also get yourself a game. Again, I'm going to encourage you to go reach out to our friends over at World of Game Design or our friends over at itch.io and you can get your, uh, your PDFs at a very steep discount. 
um, for the month of May, which is going to be pretty exciting. So until next time, though, folks, I am Kyle at For Desks and Dorks. You guys have been absolutely amazing. I will see you in the next one. Peace.